Hey guys, welcome back to the show. And on this episode, I'm going to be talking about a Wes Craven movie that had to undergo a bunch of reshoots and rewrites. And so much of it was changed in post-production that in the end, the movie apparently lost a lot of the original plot. Now, I'm sure you want to know what this movie is all about. Well, it's quite simple, really. It's a movie about friendship. And you know what? I'd argue that that's what a lot of Wes Craven's movies are about. Seriously, when you look past all the blood and gore and violence, what's left? That's right, friends working together. Think about it. Nightmare on Elm Street, friends trying to keep each other awake. Scream, friends trying to find out who the killer is. My soul to take. Uh, well, okay, I actually didn't see that, but I'm sure there's some friends in there somewhere. This movie is called Deadly Friend, and it really takes friendship to a new level. I mean, I'm sure some of you have friends of your own. You might even think that they're great friends. Well, ask yourself this. Have any of your friends ever brought you back to life? The movie starts with Paul and his mom moving into their new house, and it turns out Paul is some sort of teenage prodigy who has built a robot named BB. And this is where Paul meets Tom, the local paper boy who kind of sucks at riding a bike. And here's the thing, BB is actually pretty advanced. I mean, this is some impressive artificial intelligence, which is cool and all, but as I mentioned a few weeks ago, having a robot friend would be awesome unless they're too smart. I mean, you never want this thing to come to the realization that you are the only thing that stands in its way of roaming completely free. That would be just such a crappy way to die. See, I never want to be killed by something that I created, you know? That's why I never want to have kids. I'm serious, I'm not gonna take the chance. And they know when you're at your most vulnerable. They can smell fear. I'm constantly upgrading him so you can never know what he's gonna do. Paul has a scholarship at one of the best medical schools in the country studying the human brain because he's so smart. So Paul meets the pretty girl next door and her name is Sam, but uh-oh, she has a bruise on her arm. And you know what that means. She must be really clumsy. You know, bumping into stuff all the time. You can't have someone like that around an important piece of equipment like this. So Paul is like, hey, why don't you come over right now? And she's like, oh, sorry, I'd love to, but I can't. My father is staring at me menacingly. And in case you haven't guessed it by now, her father is an abusive piece of shit. I mean, look, all the telltale signs are right there. The bruise on her arm, the evil look on his face, the scary music they play over top of it. And that's what's so great about movies, you know? That's all you need. And it's not just Sam's father who's crazy. There's this psycho lady named Elvira that lives across the street, and she just loves to wave the shotgun around. One day I'm gonna crack this combination, walk up, and hand her the paper. <laughs> See, this guy is the opposite of me. I'm fine not antagonizing the armed mentally ill. Of course, those aren't the only people on the street Paul has to watch out for. There's also a gang of dirt bike bullies. Like, imagine if this was your first introduction to the neighborhood you just moved into. You got an abusive alcoholic next door, psycho with a shotgun across the street, a dirt bike gang just looking for trouble. So, yeah, I guess having a block party is kind of out of the question. I mean, you could do it, I just feel like those are the types of people who wouldn't bring anything. And even if they did, yeah, I'm not trusting Elvira's potato salad. Anyways, I guess it's a good thing that BB has been programmed not to take shit from anyone. So Sam comes over and brings him some cookies. Paul takes her up to his room and she's like, wow, you really are a nerd. But then her father comes over and takes her home. Later that night, Sam has a nightmare where she tries to kill him, but it doesn't work. You can't hurt me, cause daddy don't wanna be hurt! And see, this is why you should have one of those dream interpretation books. Because a dream like this could mean anything. It could mean that she has some serious underlying trauma that she needs to address, or maybe she just ate some ice cream before bed. That's a thing. Like, that's real, you know. It happens to me. If I eat ice cream before bed, it is guaranteed that I'm gonna have a dream where I'm murdering someone. 
possibly multiple people. It even happens if I don't eat ice cream. It happens all the time. Okay, maybe not all the time. More like, I don't know, every other night. Anyways, despite all the bad people in the neighborhood, Paul seems to be enjoying his life, being super smart and playing basketball with his friends until BB throws the ball and it goes over the fence and onto Elvira's porch. And you might be thinking, maybe they're gonna come up with a bunch of funny methods to try and get the ball back, kind of like in the sand lot, but no, she just takes the ball. Biggest mistake she'll ever make. Later that night, Sam comes over with a nosebleed and Paul's mom is like, look, Sam, you gotta tell someone about your abuse of father. I mean, sure, I don't really know what's going on, but he seems like a dick and now you have a nosebleed. Not that hard to put two and two together, Sam. Sometimes I wanna roll the truck over his face, but he's still my father. Anyways, it's Halloween, so they go out playing pranks on people and decide to get BB to crack the combination and open the lock on Elvira's fence. And this is kind of weird. Sam goes to ring the doorbell, a bunch of alarms go off, she starts screaming, and then she trips as she's trying to leave. Then the guys help her, but instead of just leaving and running away, they hide behind the bushes. BB isn't responding to Paul's remote, and starts coming up to the porch and Elvira just unloads her shotgun, completely destroying BB. And look, I can't really blame her because I would do the exact same thing in this situation. It's only a matter of time before AI reaches this point. Are you just gonna stand there when the machines start walking up to your front door? Will you be prepared to protect yourself and your family from the inevitable robot invasion? Because it's coming. You may think I sound crazy right now, but do I? Do I really? And of course, Paul is pretty broken up about everything. I mean, he lost his robot friend, but I'm sure he'll be okay because he still has his other friends like Tom and Sam, and I'm sure everything's going to be just fine. Nothing bad's going to happen with them. But just when Sam thought it was safe, she goes and does something crazy, like eating dinner at Paul's house and this sends her father into a drunken rage. She falls down the stairs and oh my God, she's brain dead. Believe it or not, this movie has a very important message in case you didn't realize. It's trying to make a point about the dangers of owning a staircase in your house. See, if they lived in a bungalow, this probably wouldn't have happened. So for all you young people out there, if at some point you win the lottery and are able to actually afford a house, make sure that it's only one floor or instead of a staircase, it has some kind of a contraption made up of slides and ropes and pulleys and I don't know, you figure it out. It's your house. They take Sam to the hospital, but the doctor has some bad news for Paul. We have her on life support. Her brain is dead, Paul. By the way, when you leave, there's a machine right beside the doors on your way out. That's where you pay for your parking, but I'm just gonna give you the heads up right now. It's a really old machine, so you're gonna have to swipe your credit card probably three or four times before it actually goes through. I know, it's a real pain in the ass. I've been trying to tell them to replace it for years, but nobody listens to me. The doctor, just, just so you're aware. Obviously, Paul is really upset, but this is when he comes up with a brilliant idea because, you know, he's really smart and stuff. So he goes over to Tom's house and I guess just lets himself in. What? what? Do, do you know what time it is? And I need your dad's keys just for the night. It's funny how it's always like this in movies and TV shows. I mean, imagine you're sleeping and suddenly your friend just walks into your room. And not only that, but it's six in the morning? I mean, the only way that's forgivable is if it's to inform you that you just won a large sum of money. And you can now afford a house with only one floor. But in this case, it's Paul asking Tom for his dad's keys to the university hospital because Paul is going to bring Sam back to life. Hey, you owe me, Tom. No way. You owe me. It's because of you, BB got killed. Yeah, it's your fault that my robot got shot to death. So now you have to help me kidnap a dead body so that I can try to bring it back to life. 
I mean, that's only fair. But first, they need to get out of the house to even begin this crazy experiment. So what does Paul do? Does he tell his mom that he's staying over at Tom's for the night? No, that's boring. He drugs her. And with his mom passed out on the couch, they're free to steal the van, take Sam's dead body from the hospital without anyone noticing, and Paul implants BB's brain into her brain. So they take her back to Paul's house and put her in the shed. That's when Tom realizes, uh, hey, your mom is still unconscious in the exact same spot she was when we left. And Paul begins to worry that he may have accidentally killed his mom. But it turns out she's okay, which is a relief because bringing one dead body back to life is hard enough. Some of you may be thinking that Paul took things too far here by drugging his mom, but whatever. What? She was the one who canceled Jerry. Yeah, I'm still upset about that. She never even gave it a chance. So as Tom leaves, Paul is like, hey, let's keep this just between us, okay? And quite frankly, Paul, I don't think you have anything to worry about. I mean, you both committed a shit ton of crimes tonight. I don't even know where to begin. So Paul turns Sam on, and this is what I find kind of confusing. I mean, she has BB's brain, so it's basically BB inside of Sam's body but she goes out to get revenge as Sam, so I guess it's like a combination of the two brains, I don't know. The next day, Sam's dad awakens from his drunken slumber and notices the door is open. Then he notices that there's a lot of smoke coming from the basement. And this is actually the most unbelievable part of the movie. As a dad, he should know instantly if someone touched the thermostat. That should have been the first thing he noticed. So he sees that the furnace is just going crazy and holy crap, it's Sam acting like a robot. And this just makes no sense at all. I mean, she has superhuman strength. She has the same strength as a machine, but she still has the same body. Her body is human. By the way, if you recognize her, this is Christy Swanson. She played Buffy the Vampire Slayer in the original movie. Paul notices the smoke coming out of the chimney and comes downstairs to find Sam's father in the furnace. So Paul has the idea to just hide the body in the basement. And I gotta say, Paul, it seems to me like the solution is right there in front of you. That furnace is pretty big. And okay, fine, maybe the whole body can't fit in there at once. That's when you get creative. Come on, you're smart. I could figure this out. In fact, I'm pretty sure I had a dream where I did this. But the fun doesn't stop there. I mean, sure, Sam wanted revenge on her father, but BB has a score to settle as well. I mean, Elvira stole their basketball and BB was pretty pissed off about that when it happened. And if there's one thing we know about computers, it's that they don't forget things unless the hard drive crashes because you bought a cheap one for your parents' computer and they never back anything up and now they're pissed off because all the family photos were on there. You guys wanted to save money. Either way, computers can hold a grudge, especially if you ruin a good time for them. And BB isn't going to let this go. He can't let it go. So Sam opens the lock the same way that BB did on Halloween. And what could be more terrifying than being home alone and suddenly a basketball bounces into the room in slow motion? I don't know, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head. That would be pretty strange. Like that would be really spooky. Especially if you didn't own a basketball. I mean, you kind of dug your own grave here, Elvira. You stole their ball and destroyed their robot. Crimes that I'm pretty sure everybody agrees should be punishable by death. So yeah, you ruin their basketball game? Well, Sam's gonna ruin your head. You're probably thinking, okay, now this is ridiculous, especially since, again, Sam is not a machine. She can only throw this ball so hard. Well, I don't know what's involved in the physics of inflatable rubber balls versus human skulls, but I'm pretty sure there's something with the velocity and the right angle and point of contact that makes this entirely possible. Of course, Paul's got to keep Sam locked in the attic now because she keeps going out and killing people. And this is what I don't understand, Paul. If you're such a genius, can't you at least program her to do this stuff in a way that doesn't attract so much attention? 
you know, keep the exploding heads to a minimum? How about just strangling these people and getting rid of the bodies so that nobody knows what happened to them? I'm not going to say program her to stop killing entirely because she is kind of improving the neighborhood. I'm just saying if I owned a house on that street and suddenly the psycho lady with a shotgun and the drunken abusive piece of shit are suddenly gone, my property value starts to look a little bit better. Sam finds a picture of her and Paul with BB and she's like, holy crap, that's me, the robot, but I'm also the girl at the same time? And this gets her really upset. But then Tom calls. I'm gonna tell Paul. I, I can't keep this a secret anymore. It's eating me up alive. What's happening is too important. Tom, come on. Tom, when I'm talking like this, it means I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But seriously, though, uh, just out of curiosity, if you were to just stop delivering papers suddenly, is there someone who would just step right in and take that over? Like, would anyone ask a lot of questions? What about family members, Tom? Do you have a big family? I mean, other than your dad, would anyone really notice if you were gone for a few days or weeks? months. Put it this way, how long do you think it would take until somebody called in a missing persons report? Can you give me an estimate on that? Just like a ballpark figure. Well, Paul, I guess your big old brain couldn't have predicted this. Tom wants to spill the beans. So I guess you really only got one option here. You got to snuff out Tom. Just get Sam to make it look like an accident. Like he fell off his bike. I mean, that's happened before. And the guy never wears a helmet, so that's believable. Or blame it on his job. Make it look like he was crushed under a pile of newspapers. And then just tell people, oh yeah, he was a, it's a real tragedy. Uh, not a lot of people knew this about him, but he had very soft bones. So Paul gets Tom to come over and see Sam, but Tom is like, nah, nah, this is too weird. And after a bit of fighting in the living room, Paul punches Tom in the face as his mom comes home. And I'm calling the cops. Tom, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you've done. And I'm gonna stop you. See, now that is a devoted friend. I'm not saying that your friends should kill for you, but it's the thought that counts. You know, it's a nice gesture. Sam seems to be completely out of control at this point. She's basically ready to kill everyone. And again, I don't understand where this incredible strength came from or this bloodlust. I mean, did Paul program this into BB in the first place? In the end, Sam runs at the police and gets shot. And just when you think this is the end of the movie, it's not. The movie gives us an ending that makes completely no sense. They take Sam to the morgue, but Paul isn't going to give up. He really likes her. And to his surprise, Sam starts choking him, and then it's revealed that it's a robot inside of Sam's body? What? Now, it's possible that this is actually a dream, but the movie doesn't do anything to really confirm that or communicate that to the audience. It just ends with her killing him. So, it's pretty odd. Now, what's interesting about this movie is that it was originally supposed to be a sci-fi thriller that was focused on the love story between Sam and Paul, but after they did a test screening, the audience was extremely critical of the fact that it wasn't like Wes Craven's other movies in terms of violence and gore. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, they did a bunch of reshoots and rewrites, but the new version was actually too violent and it was given an X rating. So they had to cut out a bunch of stuff in order to get an R rating. And the R rating wasn't easy to get. Apparently the movie was submitted to the MPAA 13 times before it was finally given the R rating. A while back there was an online petition to release the original cut of the movie as well as Wes Craven's cut, but apparently all of that footage has been lost. But well, that's pretty much it for this one. As usual, thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you all next time. Also, it smells like death in here, doesn't it? Wouldn't you agree? It smells like death in here? I've asked them, why don't you take the bodies down to the morgue faster? And they say, oh, we don't have enough staff. Well, figure something out, because it's really gross. I mean, I have to come into this smell every morning. 
Like, would you like that? Where you work, Paul, does it smell like death all day, every day? What, what about you, Paul's mom? I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. But does it smell like death where you work? Yeah, probably not. And just one more thing. When you get home, would you mind going on ratemds.com and giving me a five-star rating? Because I, I got to get my rating up. I got a bunch of complaints about my bedside manner, whatever that means. Probably just a bunch of losers, you know, trolling me, all upset because, oh, you know, my, my father died and he didn't seem to care. Well, what, what do you want me to do? You know, I'm just a doctor. Did I make your father smoke two packs a day for the past 56 years? No, I didn't. So, whose fault is that? Not mine. My name's Sam. What's yours? Uh, Paul. I like how no matter how smart a guy is, a beautiful girl will turn him dumb. Like, this guy forgets his name just at the sight of her. She's like, oh, what's your name? And he's like, uh, Paul. Today I am super tired, just really exhausted. And it's, it's 10 o'clock at night right now, and I'm trying to get this done. And for a second there, I thought I was much further in the script than I actually was. I was like, sweet, I'm pretty much halfway. And then I realized, oh no, I'm actually only on page three of nine. It's like just a kick to the pills.